Good evening. My name is Julie Katz, Senior Director for Research and Academics at Virginia Mason Medical Center. I want to warm you, warmly welcome you to tonight's lecture series of the Digestive Disease Institute. The Digestive Disease Institute at Virginia Mason Medical Center is a multidisciplinary team that, of experts in digestive disease. They're comprised of experts in gastroenterology and also surgery, oncology, endocrinology, pathology, and other disciplines, all gathered together to provide you with the most, the highest level of quality care. We have eight centers of excellence that allow us to focus on areas of digestive disease where our experts can bring the best care to you, the patient. In addition to those centers of excellence, areas of emphasis in research and education allow our providers to push the envelope of what we know about digestive disease so that you, the patient, is always receiving the best care, most recent knowledge that we have about treatment for your disease. Our team is comprised of over 45 providers, all engaging together to, again, discover new knowledge and teach others about what we know so that you can receive the best care possible. We want to improve your health and well-being, and that's part of why we bring you this lecture series this evening. The Institute itself, since 1982, has been the center of breakthroughs that have impacted digestive disease care, not only in the regional level, but on national and international levels. To wit, we have received recognition for that, not only um, at the local level, but on the national level from various um, sources, such as uh, Leapfrog Group and, um, and the US News and World Report. The first speaker this evening is Dr. Rajesh Krishnamurthy, a gastroenterologist at Virginia Mason Medical Center. Dr. Krishnamurthy graduated from Madras Medical College in Chennai, India and then completed his residency at Wayne State University before going to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester where he completed his gastroenterology fellowship followed by an advanced therapeutic endoscopy fellowship here at Virginia Mason Medical Center. In 2017, he joined us as an attending physician specializing in advanced endoscopic treatments including Barrett's esophagus as well as hepatobiliary and pancreatic disorders. He is the recipient of numerous awards, including a research grant for developing decision aids for patients in the setting of Barrett's esophagus. He also serves as an editorial board member for several gastroenterology journals. He is active in clinical care and the patient-centered approach and has published over 16 peer-reviewed papers, a textbook chapter, and almost 50 abstracts. Our second speaker this evening is Dr. Madan Kumar Kupsami. He is the co-director of um, our Minimally Invasive Thoracic Surgery Center at Virginia Mason Medical Center. He also graduated from medical school in Chennai, India, trained in cardio and general surgery in the United Kingdom, and joined Virginia Mason in 2016. His areas of interest are cardio and thoracic surgery, including minimally invasive and robotic surgery, airway management, risk stratification, and outcome analysis of thoracic surgical procedures. As a recognized researcher, Dr. Kupasami has published over 20 scientific peer-reviewed articles and book chapters. He also developed the world's first standardized esophageal surgical complications database with an online interface that allows for research collaborations across the globe and he serves as the co-chair of Research and the Database Committee of the International Society for Diseases of the Esophagus. I hope you enjoy tonight's talks. Good evening. This is the outline of my today's talk. We are going to start with what is GERD, what is Barrett's esophagus, then we are going to move on to what is the relation between GERD and Barrett's esophagus, then we are going to move into what is the relation between Barrett's esophagus and esophageal cancer. And then we will finish the talk with who should be screened for Barrett's esophagus. And if you have Barrett's, what comes next? Let's start with the first question, what is GERD? GERD was first described in 1935 
by Dr. Winkelstein at Mount Sinai in New York. In fact, when it was first described, it was called as peptic esophagitis before it became popular as gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD. How common is GERD? The short answer is it's very common. This is a graph from a population-based study that plots the prevalence of GERD symptoms against the different age groups of the study population. As you can see, about 60% of the study population experienced GERD symptoms at least once the previous year. Up to 20% of the study population experienced GERD symptoms at least once a week. It is estimated that about 60 million Americans have ongoing GERD symptoms. How troublesome is GERD? The short answer again is very troublesome. This graph plots the various medical conditions against the quality of life along the x-axis. As you can see, patients with untreated GERD or esophagitis have worse quality of life compared to angina pectoris, which is cardiac chest pain, and even mild heart failure symptoms. So, GERD symptoms is very common and is very troublesome. So what are the symptoms of GERD? Broadly, we classify the symptoms into two categories, the typical symptoms and the atypical symptoms. The typical symptoms are the heartburn and the regurgitation symptoms. The atypical symptoms could include chest pain, laryngitis, hoarseness of voice, chronic cough, or sometimes even aspiration pneumonia. What are the risk factors for developing GERD? Broadly, we talk about modifiable risk factors and non-modifiable risk factors. The modifiable risk factors include intake of caffeine, chocolate, tobacco and alcohol use, fatty and spicy foods, basically anything that's good in life increases your risk of getting GERD. Obesity is another modifiable risk factor, but we all know it's easier, said than, it's easier said than done to lose weight. The non-modifiable risk factor includes hiatal hernia. So what is hiatal hernia? As you age, it's fairly common for the top of the stomach to squeeze itself in into the chest cavity. When that happens, it's called hiatal hernia, and when that happens, it's easy for the acid in the stomach to squeeze into the foot pipe and cause GERD symptoms. Moving to the next question, what is Barrett's esophagus? When you take a look with an endoscope or a camera down your mouth into your foot pipe and take a look at the GE junction, which is the junction of the foot pipe with the stomach, this is what it looks like, like on the picture on the left. The pink mucosa on the edges is the normal esophagus, and the salmon-colored or orange-colored mucosa on the center is the normal-appearing stomach mucosa. In other words, the foot pipe is coming together with the stomach lining. When the picture on the left starts to look like the picture on the right, that is called Barrett's esophagus. To take a closer look at the Barrett's esophagus, the pink mucosa in the edges, that's the normal esophagus, and the salmon-colored tongues or orange-colored tongues of tissue, that is the Barrett's esophagus. So what's the relation between GERD and Barrett's esophagus? That's our next question. So this graph plots the prevalence of Barrett's esophagus against the duration of GERD symptoms in years. As you can see, as the duration of GERD symptoms increases, the prevalence of Barrett's esophagus goes up. So roughly it's estimated that about 10% of patients with GERD symptoms develop Barrett's esophagus eventually. That's like 
one in 10 patients with GERD go on to develop Barrett's esophagus eventually. So why do we care about Barrett's esophagus and give it a different name and talk about it? The reason is Barrett's esophagus is a precancerous lesion for esophageal adenocarcinoma, a type of esophageal cancer. This esophageal adenocarcinoma has a very poor prognosis. The five-year survival is less than 20%. Unfortunately, the incidence of esophageal cancer has been increasing in recent times. This graph plots the incidence of esophageal cancer against the timeline. The incidence of esophageal cancer has increased from 3.6 million in 1973 to 25.6 million in 2006. So that's like a seven-fold increase in the incidence of esophageal cancer in the three decades timeline. Now let's move to the next question. What is the relation between Barrett's esophagus and esophageal cancer? The picture on the left shows the Barrett's esophagus. We looked at this image before. The picture on the right shows the esophageal adenocarcinoma or cancer developing within the Barrett segment itself. So what is the risk of cancer in Barrett's esophagus? Do all the patients with Barrett's esophagus develop esophageal cancer? Answer is no. The cancer risk in Barrett's esophagus depends on presence or absence of additional precancerous changes called as dysplasia and what's the degree of dysplasia that we see. So to determine the risk of cancer in Barrett's esophagus, we take all Barrett's esophagus patients and then ask ourselves the question, is there dysplasia? Or in other words, additional precancerous changes. If the answer is yes, then we ask, go to the next question, what degree of dysplasia? Is it low-grade dysplasia? or I-grade dysplasia. The reason we ask all these questions is the risk of cancer in this group depends on this and this also determines what kind of management strategy we take for each of these groups. So that brings us to the next question. Who should be screened for Barrett's esophagus? Any patient with chronic GERD by definition over five years of GERD symptoms and as an additional risk factor which includes any one of the following including age over 50 years, male race, white, uh, male sex, white race, hiatal hernia, patients who are obese and patients who use tobacco. So say a patient meets the criteria to be screened how do you screen for Barrett's esophagus? The screening tool for Barrett's esophagus currently is an upper endoscopy. So what does an upper endoscopy mean? It's an endoscopic procedure where the patients get sedated and then when the patient is sedated we pass an endoscope or a long tube with a camera at the tip through the mouth into the foot pipe and the stomach and then we take a close look for changes that look like Barrett's esophagus. And if you see something that looks like Barrett's esophagus, then we take biopsies to confirm it under microscopy. So say a patient meets the criteria for screening for Barrett's, undergoes an endoscopy, and they are diagnosed with Barrett's esophagus. So what comes next? Again, like we discussed earlier, we categorize them into three groups. And if a patient does not have additional precancerous changes or meaning no dysplasia, the usual management strategy is endoscopic monitoring, which means we do an endoscopy every three to five years, take a look and biopsy every single time to look for any additional changes. And if somebody has low-grade dysplasia, then there is actually a choice that the patient can choose between endoscopic monitoring or endoscopic treatment. And if patient has an I-grade dysplasia, then we recommend endoscopic treatment because the risk of cancer 
goes up significantly between low grade dysplasia to high grade dysplasia. So what is endoscopic treatment? Just briefly, the endoscopic treatment, there are several endoscopic treatment modalities. Broadly, we can classify them as a cut strategy or endoscopic mucosal resection where we shave a piece of tissue out or a burn strategy where we burn the Barrett's esophagus and your body makes normal mucosa in place of the burnt mucosa. The burning strategy is called as radio frequency ablation or called RFA. And the less common strategy for treatment is freezing the Barrett's esophagus, in other words, called cryotherapy. You freeze off the Barrett's esophagus and your body makes normal mucosa in its place. The final question is, what happens if I develop cancer? Is it the end of uh, my life? What do I do next? Fortunately, the cancer identified in patients under endoscopic monitoring is typically early stage. What does that mean? Like, I still have cancer, correct? No, it actually means something. If, if your cancer is diagnosed really early, then endoscopy therapy alone is an option without need for surgery. And even if a patient needs surgery, oftentimes the surgery is done with a curative intent and not just for palliative intent. To summarize our talk, chronic GERD is a risk factor for Barrett's esophagus. Barrett's esophagus is a risk factor for esophageal adenocarcinoma. Monitoring and treatment of Barrett's can prevent esophageal adenocarcinoma. Early esophageal cancer can be treated with endoscopic therapy alone. Thanks for your time. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, this is Dr. Madan Kupasamy, one of the thoracic surgeons at uh, Virginia Medicine Medical Center, and I'm here today to talk about um, Barrett's esophagus and uh, gastroesophageal reflex and what a surgery can do to help um, and uh, improve the situation. I know you briefly um, hear about my colleague a little bit earlier about the um, uh, details on the Barrett's esophagus and what are the treatment options, how it happens. But my role today is to describe the uh, surgical perspective of this condition to see what we can do to make this condition better. I'm trying to simplify this uh, condition in, in kind of more um, manageable uh, surgical treatment path. So that includes um, defining what the condition is and what it uh, does to patients and how this can evolve into other conditions. What is gastroesophageal reflex? As you can see in this simple uh, diagram, this is mouth and the food pipe that connects to the stomach and there is a valve mechanism that stops uh, whatever in the stomach not coming back. And there are many reasons why this could reflex back into the esophagus and cause troubles. Mostly uh, the sphincter that stops this as it coming back is not working very well. That is inappropriate relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. Or uh, there are times where the stomach got pushed into the chest with increased pressure inside the belly that is a small hiatal hernia. Those are the uh, surgically correctable and, and common scenarios that we will be talking about today. Yes, surgery uh, has a role, but before surgery, what are other things that we can do to um, uh, minimize the reflux happening? So obviously the risk factors that are modifiable, starting with weight loss and stopping smoking for a smoker and keeping your head end of the bed elevated, minimizing the risk of the acid coming back to esophagus, avoiding large meal before bed and uh, taking medication if you do have relief from medications and other um, aggravating factors, particularly some type of foods tends to increase the concentration of acid in your food, therefore more damage to the um, esophagus if that comes into the esophagus contact. So these are um, very easily doable, but not necessarily um, going to give a reliable result for everybody in spite of their best efforts. If you do have a reflex, uh, our gas American Gastroenterology Association strongly recommends medical therapy as a first line of treatment because this tends to change the clinical course of the reflex and therefore not developing Barrett's and therefore minimizing the risks of cancer formation in the future. But there are other options if you are not able to take medication or if you're not actually relieved um, of reflex symptoms with the medical therapy, you should consider surgical interventions. 
even if you are um, on a very good um, uh, medical therapy with the adequate um, response, there are about half the patients need to have either increased dosages or additional medications to achieve the same amount of symptom relief, meaning that the medical therapy alone may not be um, enough. And as you may have heard already, there are some, um, some bad press about this PPA medications of late, including uh, bone weaknesses and some uh, increased pneumonia risks and uh, some uh, magnesium deficiency, diarrhea, nausea, bloating sensation, especially uh, recent publications have some association with the kidney dysfunctions and some uh, exacerbated dementia uh, risks and all that. Although they are not all direct causations, but there are some associations with this medication, especially if you've been taking a uh, long term. But in spite of those, all those things, we still recommend this medication because they do too much good to be uh, discontinued. And this is one um, very large uh, cohort of paper, uh, patient study and came in um, British Medical Journal back in 2012 that kind of brought this into general public uh, awareness that these PPA medications are not without risk. If we are looking for any non-medical therapy that is uh, surgical or uh, other endoscopic interventions, and uh, we need to have some reliable solution for it that comes in terms of uh, surgical therapy. And we have looked into uh, randomized control studies uh, with varying uh, length of follow-ups. More than 90% of them do suggest and support surgical therapy is a very good uh, effective alternate for medical therapy, especially somebody who does not have a good response to medical therapy or who does not want to be on medical therapy. And they also prove that they uh, maintain the uh, quality of life and also certainly uh, objectively uh, confirm less acid exposure to the esophagus. Like I mentioned, patients who do not want to be on medical therapy or have any side effects would consider surgery. Who should have surgery? There are um, patients with very small uh, problem or with a large complex problem which needs a complex intervention. And with the advancement of technology, we now are able to offer incisionless endoscopic uh, interventions to restore the anatomy, therefore the reflex is taken care of it, which is something that we offer in our uh, institute with our expert uh, gastroenterology colleagues and uh, surgical teams. But most commonly, if you do have a anatomical defect with a hernia or a weak valve that is not able to stop the acid going to the chest, then uh, you need to have a surgical intervention, which is the gold standard, uh, either laparoscopically or um, other open procedures. I'll go into the details in a minute. There are other uh, surgical but less um, invasive options also available, but I will uh, update on the uh, latest technology on this area. So this simple uh, diagram de demonstrates the acid going back into the esophagus because the valve that is supposed to stop the acid is not working very well, therefore the damage in the esophagus. And this is another diagram depicting the same. Um, when the valve is not working very well, acid goes back into the esophagus and causing this damage. At times, the diaphragm that is supposed to um, limit the stomach going back into the chest is not quite intact, let the stomach slip back into the chest, and therefore the valve is weak and also part of the stomach gone into the chest through the defect in the diaphragm. This is all the things that we will be correcting surgically. There are different types, different severity. It may be just small portion of the stomach going in or portion of it, or it could be stomach and also other organs from the abdomen going into the chest that all need surgical correction, regardless whether they have symptoms or not. So the aim of the surgery is to bring the stomach where it belongs, strengthen the valve that is supposed to stop the acid going back to the chest, and also repairing the uh, defect. And this is to achieve symptom relief and also restoring the anatomy and normal function of the stomach and the esophagus. There are different approaches. Uh, minimally invasive or open procedures, usually uh, it is done with the minimally invasive operations as we do in our institute anywhere between 200 to 250 a year with very good results and published uh, multiple times about our um, uh, durability and uh, long-term uh, outcomes. There are uh, other um, newer, less invasive options available, which is also something uh, uh, I'm going to talk about and uh, demonstrate here. Laparoscopic approach is something that I will focus on today. This is a commonly done surgery for this condition. It involves general anesthesia, 
about five small holes in your belly and with which the camera is inserted into the chest. And other option is to do a robotic surgery, which is also something that we do, where the instruments are inserted into the patient's abdomen and the surgeon sits in the next to a small computer console and operates instrument from outside where the nurses and other assistants stand next to the patients. But what we do inside is exactly the same. This is a small uh, a demonstration of a defect in the diaphragm. The stomach has gone into the chest and we manage to bring the stomach back to where it belongs and this is the defect in the diaphragm. This is something we will be seeing at repairing it back to normal. So as you see that there are three stitches placed, still the gap is open fourth stitch is placed and still the gap is open. So we progress to close to a near normalcy where it's not completely shut down that the foot cannot come down, but enough opening for the foot to pass through that gap in the esophagus. And then we, and this is another similar uh, procedure from another patient with a slightly more bright pictures. That's a big defect in the diaphragm that led the stomach to go back with the valve that is supposed to be here. And this is the same patient having the defect closed and looks nicely uh, restore the anatomy. And then we wrap the stomach around itself. So basically, the stomach hugging itself to give strength to the valve. And this is another clear picture of the stomach being wrapped around itself. This does uh, restore the valve function. This is the inside view of the stomach when this is done. You can see the gap in the valve. And then this is after the procedure, and the valve is nicely closing on the endoscope there. It's about two hours operations, usually overnight stay. Patient tolerate this really well. And then they progress to stepwise uh, diet from liquid to soft diet. And usually about two, three weeks, they're fully back to normal self. And most, if not all, the patients come off their acid medication at this point. And also uh, 80 to 90 percent um, uh, remain off medications for a very, very long time. And we do have more than 10 years follow-ups. And they are um, more than 80 to 95 percent patients fully satisfied with the outcome, and they do remain off medications. There are patients who may develop reflux back again, depending on their body habits, weight gain, and their lifestyle activities. But most patients, if not all of them, are very satisfied with the outcomes. And briefly, uh, alternative treatment options I mentioned earlier. There are different technology available. Um, the one that I mentioned about the incisionless procedure that is done through the endoscope inside the esophagus to strengthen the valve. There are procedures like links which puts a small magnetic ring around the esophagus to strengthen the valve. Our other uh, newer technologies are not quite well established, but the uh, esophagus which we do offer is fairly well studied, but still uh, it is not same as the um, uh, laparoscopic procedure. So this is one uh, small diagram about this incisionless procedure. Um, this is endoscope inside the stomach, and it kind of folds the valve to strengthen it. And this is a, a real patient video that we did a few days ago in our operating room. The endoscope comes in. It places a few nylon fastness that is kind of folding back the stomach itself to recreate the flap valve that stops acid coming back to the chest. And this is what we achieved. This is how the gap was. This is immediately after the procedure. This is few weeks later, still functioning very well uh, as it's intended to. This magnetic ring procedure is again uh, something that we place around the esophagus through a laparoscopic procedure. This is not a non-invasive procedure, but it tends to have a less um, acid uh, reflux or any swallowing difficulty related problems. This is the ring and magnetic ring on the esophagus. It's supposed to stop the acid going back, yet still opening enough to let the food pass through. So they're restoring the valve function by constricting from outside. And this is uh, something uh, not offered in our place, but uh, we do offer this endoscopic option, which is well studied and offers a pretty good um, results, especially for a very small hernia without major uh, need for a complex work. And that is about the reflux. And occasionally, as we uh, discussed earlier, this can progress into cancer. If it does progress into a cancer, there are endos endoscopic treatment options that would be uh, removing the tumor development from an endoscopic approach. But if that is not effective, we could proceed to resect that part of the esophagus with an operation. As a specialist center, we have repeatedly uh, reviewed our outcomes and the rest of the world's outcome to see who should be operated and who should be treated non-surgically. And we do have our specialist group here, and um, this 
Digestive Disease Institute, which is a center of excellence, which is offering full spectrum of care for the reflex conditions, barracks development, and also even if it had evolved into cancer. So uh, in this particular uh, talk, we were focusing on how this is uh, primarily a medical condition, but however, there is a, certainly a role for surgery who does not have a good relief from medical therapy or who do not want to be on medical therapy for the rest of their life. So that's where the surgery comes in handy. There are different surgical options, but as a specialist center, we offer full spectrum of surgical uh, intervention as needed. And surgery for cancer is reserved only when it is not amenable for treatment through the endoscopic approach. And that is something I just want to briefly mention. Thank you so much, and I will take questions.